Praise the Lord. What a blessing to be together as a family on the Sabbath day. And I know that uh, most of the family is away, and um, I have been blessing that they may have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath. Now, contrary to what you may think happen here during the next 40 minutes, is my sermon is really a testimony. So I want to be able to really glorify God. I love my God with all my heart. And you know, being as young as I am, and I'm not going to tell you how, how, how young I am, I have been in a journey with my Lord for quite a few decades. Quite a few decades. And I can tell you that the older I get, the more I love my Creator and my Father and my Lord. And so um, I was invited by Pastor Mario to really give my testimony today. I can tell you that um, when he invite, invited me to do so, I thought carefully. And just like any human being who has not been perfect, because I'm, a not, I'm not a perfect human being. Any human being that has gone through the crucibles of life and has really agonized with certain things that happen, I vacillated with the call to give my testimony. But eventually, as I prayed to the Lord repeatedly, I felt an urge to talk about God. And seeing that I have a significant number of years, I wrote it all down. And I wrote it all down because I do not want to meander. So I'm going to stick to the pages of my testimony. And I hope that my testimony will really be a blessing. You see, the testimony you're about to hear is purposed, purposed, to witness and glorify God, to encourage the church family to love and be supportive of one another. Remember, if you are walking towards the New Jerusalem, we are a family and we've got to be supportive of one another. And thirdly, to encourage church members to share their testimony with others. As I talk about my testimony, I hope that you will notice how God is in control. Is in control of our journey when we allow Him to guide it and direct it. He's omnipresent, but the only time He has control over you is when you, in fact, open your heart and invite Him in. In my journey, it is evident that the Holy Spirit is present at work all the time. And that he uses situations, circumstances, family members, friends, and others to, uh, to really accomplish God's objectives for each one of us. So why do I do a testimony? Well, sc Scripture tells us in Psalm 71, 14, and 15, and I hope that we will have that, Psalm 71, 14, and 15, and this is the psalmist, and the psalmist is rejoicing in what God does in his life, and the psalmist says, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more, and then verse 15 says, my mouth will tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day long. So why am I doing my testimony here? Because, because God matters. God needs to be glorified. And knowing what I know today, I need to tell everyone of what God has done for me. Telling people about your journey with the Lord 
is a privilege. And telling them how God has protected and guided us and now he has helped us in our journey is almost a duty to ensure that they understand the God that you, that you really uh, love and worship every day. Let's begin. I was born in the country of Angola. Now, Angola is a beautiful country in West Africa. At the time of my birth, Angola was a Portuguese colony. Thus, I was registered as a Portuguese citizen. And by the way, I have no regrets for that. I'm also an American today, and I carried both citizenships. But certainly, that was the case. My parents, which were from Portugal, were Seventh-day Adventist missionaries in Angola. By the way, they served in Africa for 41 years. And so my first 11 and a half years of life were spent in three different mission fields in the country of Angola. From the age of 11 and a half to 17, while my parents continued mission work in Africa, I was brought to Portugal and was enrolled in a boarding school. Not an Adventist school, just a boarding school. And by the way, for boys only. Fairly close to where my maternal grandmother lived. During those six years, God's protection was remarkable. My grandmother's resolve to bring us, my brother and I, home uh, from school every weekend ensured that I spent every Friday night and Sabbath with her and the Adventist family. My baptism in 1963 by my dad encouraged me to be as faithful as I could. I really rejoiced when I was baptized. My church's youth leaders and the church's youth I grew up with were a source of much courage and strength. And the church members in general, in general showed a great genuine interest for my well-being. At the age of 17, God intercedes and provides a major change to my journey and ultimate destiny. My parents bring me out of Portugal and send me to South Africa to attend an Adventist high school and college, the Elderberg College in the southern part of South Africa, just north of Cape Town, beautiful location. This change provided a great opportunity to grow spiritually and to grow mature. My teachers and deans were Christ-like. They were interested in my well-being and had a significant influence in my journey and my growth, my maturity. The student body was a family I enjoyed and was very comfortable with. I really enjoyed the support I received from many of my peers. Student work at Elderberg was part of the curriculum. And I want to mention that because that was relevant in my growth. During the school year, I was working about 20 to 26 hours a week. During the summer vacation and other major school vacations, I would work about 40 to 48 hours a week. You see, I was brought to South Africa because my parents did not want wanted me to be conscripted into the Portuguese army, which was fighting the liberal, uh, the liberal movements in Africa. And so I had to stay in South Africa. I couldn't leave South Africa. I couldn't go to where my parents were, otherwise I would be conscripted. So I spent my vacations working. This curriculum influenced positively my growth and maturity. At the age of 19, I was invited to attend the GC World Youth Congress in Zurich, Switzerland, as a delegate of the Mozambican Union. This event was attended by 12,000 Adventists or Adventist youths from around the world. 
Pastor Cleveland, E. E. Cleveland, the then secretary, secretary of the GC Ministerial Association, himself a youth evangelist, was the main speaker. This man, a six four, a six, six four man, tall, spoke so, so beautifully from the scripture. His given, uh, his God-given messages during the event touched my heart. I was convicted that God wanted me to be much more than an enthusiastic spectator among my brothers and sisters. And so at the final altar call, this was a five-day event, I committed myself to be a full-time servant of God and an evangelist preaching the three angels' message. I was only 19. A year later, <clears throat> unsure of what to do, and that is a weakness. I enrolled in college to do a business management degree with a religion minor. During my first year in college, the Elderberg student body was asked to raise funds to publish and print the high school and college book for the year. This invariably became a competition fundraising project between the boys and the girls residing on campus, about 85% of the student body. To my surprise, I was chosen to be the boy to be the boy, uh, I was chosen by the boys to lead the boys' fundraising campaign toward the project. Unfortunately, as we were approaching the end of the year, the excitement to do better than the girls, in line with the competitive nature that had been established, led the boys to cross the line into unacceptable behavior. As the leader of the fundraising project for the boys, I took full responsibility for the mistakes made. The admin committee felt that it was necessary to punish and reprimand such behavior. And so, I was allowed to finish the year, and I praise the Lord for that, but I was punished with hard labor and I was told that I would not be allowed to return back to college. I had been expelled. I was devastated. And I felt a tremendous humiliation. I knew that what the boys did was not appropriate. There certainly was a case for reprimand and punishment. However, it was very difficult for me to be told to pack my belongings, to leave campus, and not return, at least for the immediate future. My parents were devastated and very concerned with my well-being. I left the school and immediately looked for work and a room to live in. Shortly thereafter, I was hired by an auditing firm. This gave me an opportunity to work as an auditor and gave me hope to do my business degree online. It also gave me permanent res residence in South Africa. I was really hurting, really hurting. I avoided contact or interaction with most Adventists I knew. I was ashamed of what had taken place. I maintained some contact with my close Adventist friends, but avoided spending quality time with them. I stopped going to church. I just did not want to talk about what had happened. I didn't want to see uh, any individual I knew. Slowly but surely, I began to live like most non-Christians. And I'm not going to uh, give glory to the devil. I'm not going to tell you what I did and did not do. Yeah. I also failed to do my business degree online as I hoped to do. 
And eventually, I left the auditing firm and joined the textile manufacturing business where I became fairly successful. At the age of 28, I spent just over a year developing the business in Australia. And upon my return to South Africa, I was given the portfolio of VP for marketing and sales for the corporation. And this was a significant corporation. I also got married during this period. And even though we did not attend church, we got married in a Seventh-day Adventist church. During this period of time, during these 10 years, I experienced a significant number of emotions and feelings. I was amazed at how well I had done from a world, worldly perspective, really was. And yet there wasn't a day that went by that I felt completely satisfied or at peace. Peace with the journey I was on. I just was not satisfied. There was something that wasn't quite, quite, quite right. I had no real, no real peace and satisfaction. The status, the position, the money, the perks, the travel, and anything else I did did not provide real peace and joy. There seemed to be a constant turmoil within me. I knew the truth, and I knew that I was not living it. Most nights as I lay down in bed to rest, I would be reminded of all the wrong things I had done and the wrong things and the wrong thoughts that came to my mind. I knew that my parents and my maternal grandmother, my mom's mother, were very concerned with me and my journey. The letters I received, and trust me, there were many, were full of scripture and prayer. And I'm ashamed to tell you that I was so guilty that I would answer maybe every seventh month or eighth month. I sensed the agony, the despair, and the constant appeal to God for mercy. I would also be reminded from time to time that in 1969, I had made a commitment to God at the GC World Youth Congress in Zurich, Switzerland, that I was committed to be a full-time servant of God and an evangelist preaching the three angels' message. But I also missed church. I missed going to church. I missed Elderberg and the family at Elderberg, the teachers, the students, my very good friends. I missed the daily fellowship I had with friends that love God and were committed to walk with God every day. I miss studying the Bible and praying with my friends. And I just miss working with Jesus every day. In the security of a campus where God is present, you sense God 24-7. On the Sabbath afternoon at around 1 p.m. on July of 1982, a couple of cars stopped in front of my home. I want you to understand Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m., while I was working in the garden with my gardener. As I walked towards the cars, two of the very good friends I had at Helderberg came out of their cars with their families and walked towards me. They were in Sabbath attire. They had just come out of church and were looking for me. One of the two friends lived a couple of streets away in the same neighborhood. He knew that I was living in the area, and so he told me that he often went around the neighborhood hoping to find me. That's a friend. In spite of the fact that I was sweaty, dirty on the day of the Lord, and that just put out the cigarette when I saw the cars approaching. They were truly delighted to see me. They gave me a hug and a showed respect for who I was at that moment. They told me that they wanted to spend some time with me and my family, and without hesitation, I invited them to come to my place the very next day. 
the time I spent on Sunday afternoon with my friends and their families in my home was a divine appointment. In those five to six hours we were together, we were able to re revisit the past, talk about the friendship we had established, either while growing in the mission field or at Helderberg. We also talked about our present journey, the families we had become, the work we were doing, and the lifestyle, lifestyle we had all embraced. At the end of that afternoon, that visit, I felt blessed. And I knew that the Lord had brought us together. I felt the Holy Spirit at work. As my two good friends and their family said their goodbyes and entered their vehicles, the friend that lived in the area, the friend that was driving around to find me, opened his car window. The motor, the, the motor was already on and asked me if I had a commitment or plans for the following Sabbath. Now, to be honest with you, I don't recall whether I had a commitment or plans for the following Sabbath. I, I don't really recall. But I know that I told him that I was free, that I had no plans. Such was the joy to be with friends that I could trust. He smiled and said to me, Good. I will pick you up and your family this coming Sabbath morning. Be ready at 9.30. We are going to church. And as he finished saying that, he took off. He closed his car window. He left. And before I had the chance to reconsider, he was gone. Amen. I can tell you that my family and I were ready to go to church the next Sabbath morning at 9.30 a.m. What a blessing. I am eternally grateful to God for wonderful friends that were willing to be used and be guided by the Holy Spirit to visit, to spend some time with us, and invite us to come to church with them. They showed genuine love and care for me and my family in spite of the condition they found me in. This was an important event in my conversion experience. I began to attend church every Sabbath thereafter. And I began to clean up and follow God's precepts and His fundamental beliefs. About three months un, uh, uh, after my return to church, we're talking about September, October, I was invited to co-teach in the Sabbath school I was attending. By the way, my friend was the teacher. This was an active Sabbath school discussion class. This gave me the impetus to study the Bible on a regular basis, and it gave me an opportunity to teach and witness. Toward the end of the same year, the then president of the Trans-Africa Division in Africa, Elder Kenneth Midleider, was invited to preach at our church. Elder Ken was going to hold an evangelistic series in one of the main churches in, in the Cape Town area, and he was invited to come to our church to preach and promote the evangelism series. That Sabbath, Elder Metline arrived at our church pretty early. And he was brought to attend our discussion class. Well, that Sabbath, I was teaching. Elder Metline introduced him to the class. I did not know him. I was separated from church hierarchy for quite a few years. We had a very good discussion class that Sabbath. We closed with prayer, and I invited the class members to move on to the church, prop, to, to, to the church promptly. To my amazement and concern, Elder Matlida stayed put until everybody else had left the Sabbath school class. He's our, he was our guest speaker. And I wanted to make sure that he was available on time to fulfill his assignment. 
So I thanked him for being at the Sabbath School class, for participating in the discussion, and I invited him to walk with me toward the sanctuary. So he turned around to me and said, I have thoroughly enjoyed the Sabbath School and your teaching. And I have been waiting for an opportunity to talk with you. So I waited for everybody else to leave. Do you have time? Hmm. So I said, uh, I do, but I'm concerned. You are our guest speaker. I, I want to make sure that you are available on time to fulfill the assignment. So he said to me, Victor, I don't want you to worry about it. I have time. It is now a priority to me. So he's asked, tell me about yourself and what you do for a living. Still concerned about time. I was very brief. My answer was brief. And I provided a question. Uh, you know, I answered the question. He told me that he was touched by my enthusiasm and love for God and his word. So he asked me if I had ever considered being a full-time pastor or evangelist. How the Lord connects the dots. This shocked me and choked me. I cried. I was crying. But Paul also provided me an opportunity to briefly talk about the journey I had been on. And my great desire to be working with the church as a whole to preach and teach the word of God. Elder Ken embraced me just like a father. He was a tall American guy and just a bare embracement. And then prayed with me and encouraged me to pursue those goals and objectives. He also wanted my information and I provided it to him. He then asked me to attend his evangelistic series, which I did. And during those series, via profession of faith, I gave my heart and soul to the Lord. And I became again an active member of the Adventist Church. Please note, what started with a few friends that searched for me and took me to church, by the end of the year, I had turned my life around to a full commitment to work for the Lord. And so, just over a, a year later, I was back at Elderberg College, now as a married student, uh, with one son to finish my understand, uh, uh, understand, uh, undergraduate studies. I graduated three years later and received a call from the church from the, seventh, uh, from the South African Union to serve as VP of Finance and Marketing at the church's largest publishing house in Southern Africa, serving really the southern part of Africa from the Republic of Congo, uh, Burundi, um, uh, and obviously Tanzania, and um, all the way down to South Africa. Just... Um, Towards the fall of 1990, I was invited by the executive committee of the publishing house to do my graduate studies at Andrews University. And so I came to the United States uh, in early January of 1992, to be honest, January 2 of 1992. And that year I completed my graduate studies at Andrews. Soon after that, I received a call from the general conference to serve at the Adventist Media Center. This made my U.S. stay permanent. The United States was now my home, was now my country. While working as a manager for 16 years at It Is Written, and then nine years at The Voice of Prophecy, God provided a wonderful opportunity to fulfill the commitment I made to him in 1969. Remember, I didn't do theology. And I'm not going to tell you why I couldn't do theology. But he gave me that opportunity. He gave me the opportunity to be totally involved in ministries dedicated to soul winning through the teaching and preaching of the word. 
And yes, it was a great joy, a privilege, a blessing to see throughout the world, and I really mean throughout the world, tens of thousands of people give their hearts to the Lord and become part of his church through baptism. To God, I give all glory. Brethren, my friends, family, the journey I have been on for many years now has taught me to trust and obey God. I'm really thankful that God has been in control of my journey and that the Holy Spirit is present at work in my life every day to accomplish God's objectives for me. What he did for me, what God has done for me, God will do for you. You've got to invite him in. Open your heart. Bring him in. And allow him to turn, change the things he needs to change. When the Lord comes in, and you know that portion of Scripture, when he comes in, he wants to spend time with you. He wants to sup with you. Read the Word. It tells you that. And then he wants to stay with you for a little while. He's expecting you to say, I've got a spare bedroom. Will you stay the night with me? Open the door of your heart to the Lord. Allow him in. I would like to end this testimony with a few verses of Scripture to encourage you to place your trust and hope in God. Now, there's only five Scriptures that I want to share with you. But I hope that you found this testimony a blessing. But I want you to leave here today knowing what God can do for you. So the first of the verses I want to bring to you is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And this is what, um, this, is what this verse of Scripture says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Note, this passage of Scripture encourages us to spend some time in God's presence and seek his will every day. This will lay a solid foundation for a life built on trust, in trust in Christ. God will never disappoint you. Through the Holy Spirit, he will open up new horizons of what life can offer. The more closely you and I walk with him, the more clearly you and I will understand all that he can do in and through our lives. Here's another piece, another verse that I want to uh, read and talk to you about. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verses 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. Mmm, what a verse. I know the plans I have for you. God has a plan for each one of us. I know the plans that he has for you. Then it says, declares the Lord, plans to prosper, to prosper you and not to harm you. Note, this passage of Scripture tells us that a sure way of increasing our hope is to work hard at maintaining a positive faith in Jesus Christ. The more real Christ becomes in us, the more our fears will be transformed into a steadfast, constant faith in the Lord. Trust God. Trust Him. Put your life at His care. Let's go to Psalm 23:4. Beautiful. You know the psalm, I'm sure. Psalm 23, 4 tells us, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you, God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Note that Scripture never tries to hide the dark shadows of life. You are going to go through crucibles. It's part of refining a relationship with God. You just are. 
This verse of Scripture describes how God is always with us. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, therefore we should fear no evil because God is always with us. Let's go back to Second Samuel. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Second Samuel, chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. Hmm. I have sent this verse to quite a few people, read it to quite a few people, and I treasure it. Here's what, what it says. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. Note this passage of scripture tells us that the love and omnipotence of God protects us. What's the, what's the definition of God? Love. God is love. Period. His love. Absolutely. His love. And his care, his grace, will be able to overcome any challenge, adversity, or problem we may be facing. And I want to finish with three verses in Psalm 121. Psalm 121, three verses. Oh, this is beautiful. And I feel a joy when I do that. I lift my eyes to the hills. Lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Who's the Lord? He's the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. What a promise. The psalmist here tells us that the Lord never loses concentration while he watches over you and over me. He never loses any concentration. God is consistently by our side. He should be in us. But we've got to open the heart to get him in. But he's with us all the time. Thank you. God watches over us constantly. Our God, who made the heavens and the earth, is able to protect his children perfectly at all times. So I have a little sentence that I'm going to that I'm going to call on for you to take on with. Have faith and have courage. God loves you. Walk with him every day. And you will be blessed eternally. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for being the God you are. I know what it meant to my life to know that you were with me every day and that you transformed my heart and my mind when I opened the door of my heart and you came in. I want to thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit whom you provided to continuously be part of our journey. Encourage us. Admonish us. Help us to redirect our focus. A Holy Spirit, Lord, that was const const constantly effective in transforming my character to reflect Jesus' character. I want to thank you, Lord, that you and the Holy Spirit use family and friends, use circumstances and situations
to bring us close to you. Father, we want to be your children and live with you permanently. Continue, Lord, to work in our hearts and our minds and bring us through, Father, until you come so we may enter the kingdom of God with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.